Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Can you all hear me in the back? OK. <laughs> I am uh, grateful for the kind and generous remarks, David. I had to remind myself I was not dead, and that was not my eulogy. <laughs> I am uh, delighted to be here, a great turnout. And I want to tell you a story about one individual. But before I do that, I must confess that I am a little bit uneasy talking to you today. It all started with a flight in Raleigh that was delayed. And I was sitting there. I didn't know when it was going to take off. I was bored stiff. I finally took out my iPad, only to find out the battery was dead. <laughs> I was sitting there, and I picked up a newspaper, an abandoned newspaper, and I started mechanically scanning it. And I came across a very interesting article. It's on a subject on communications, a study that was done on communications. It was done by a prestigious university, Tufts University in Massachusetts. And essentially what the study concluded was that the average American spends 80% of his waking hours listening, pretty much like you're doing right now. Unfortunately, we only hear 50% what's being said, understand only half of that, remember even less. Our attention span is two minutes. If there's verbal and nonverbal communications, go with the nonverbal communications because that is more accurate. And we use only about 37% of our listening capacity. I was sharing that information with my wife over breakfast. And she says, aren't you talking at Elon? I said, yes, I am. And she said, well, that ought to be a waste of time. <laughs> but you're already here. I'm already here, traveled all the way from Southern Pines. So we might as well give this thing a stab and see if we can make, make it work. This is one individual's journey in space and time. As far as space is concerned, it took me, it started in this little yellow spot here, Lithuania, took me all over Europe. And then as I joined Special Forces, it traveled all over the world. It's a journey in time. I was born at a very early age. <laughs> and over time, I grew into a shriveled up old man. I want to tell my story in three parts. One is remember. To remember defines who we are. Without memory, you cannot learn. Just think of, imagine not being able to remember anything, how empty life would be. Then I'd like to reflect, to look back calmly, thoughtfully, in order to gain a better understanding. And last but not least, to renew. We have the responsibility. We may not be responsible, Bill, responsible for getting knocked down and being on our knees, but we are responsible for picking ourselves up and going on with life and trying to make life as productive as we possibly can. And that's what the story will be like. I was born in a small little country, Lithuania. It's one of the Baltic states. Currently, they're sweating out the Ukraine situation because they're in the same predicament. They have a lot of Russian-speaking people there that Putin might want to protect them. The three million, we have cities that are bigger than, than this country. It's a very picturesque country. The population of Lithuania, the city that I lived in, was 160,000, 40,000. Every fourth person in that city was Jewish. 
I was born right here in this building right here. The building was owned by my grandfather. We lived in harmony. None of us, in our wildest dreams, anticipated was about to descend. That's me, my mother, my father on the main street in Kaunas. And as you can see early on, I had a passion for a beret. <laughs> we were not rich, but we were well off. My grandfather was well off. And uh, that gave us a safety net for my family and my, my parents. Now, the fact that the war, the clouds of war were gathering in Europe, we were aware. We did not have cable TV, cable news, 24-hour news. But nonetheless, information did reach us. And we knew that in the western part of Europe, they were in trouble. Denmark, Norway, Netherlands, France, Belgium, already under Nazi control. England was defiantly holding out. My parents refused to accept the inevitable. They were educated in Germany, and they said, I know these people. That's, that's not them they're describing. Besides that, that's way on the other side of Europe. It doesn't concern us. A false, false sense of security was further reinforced when in 1939 the Soviet Union and Germany signed a non-aggression pact. Molotov and Ribbentrop represented each country. And it was an agreement of mutual need. Hitler wanted to continue his war in the West and stabilize it before he opened up a new front. <clears throat> and Stalin was not ready for anything. So they had an agreement. What we did not know, that there was a secret annex with this agreement. And this agreement broke up Eastern Europe, where about this line here, Poland, Belarus, was under German control or German influence. And Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia was under Russia's influence. And so early on in 1940, the Soviets asserted themselves in Lithuania, and life became kind of difficult. In 1941, Hitler opened up the Second Front. He felt that the Western Front was pretty well stabilized Britain would not do any harm. Can you see OK? <coughs> and on 24 June 1941, troops entered countless Lithuania. And within the first 30 days, 10,000 Jews were brutally murdered. Not by the Germans, ironically, but by fellow neighbors and friends, fellow Lithuanians. Order number 1-15 was issued shortly after the occupation. And essentially, it forbid Jews to walk on the sidewalk. You had to walk in the gutter. It forbid the use of parks, public places, forbidden use of all forms of transportation. You had to wear Star David on the front and the back to identify you as a Jew. Curfew was from 8 to 6 AM. You could employ other, you could not employ any other nationality other than another Jew. You could not sell property. You were forbidden to own a weapon, which sometimes complicated lives because a kitchen knife could be interpreted to be a weapon if you got in trouble or got somebody crossed. Merchants could refuse to sell you, which made difficult these for a family to acquire food. Killing a Jew was not a crime, and that's why 10,000 were killed. And then we were given 30 days to move into 
a small little village outside of Kaunas called Treblenka, not Treblenka, I'm sorry, called Viljampoli. You see pictures of it. You normally see concentration camps. You see these symmetrically aligned barracks. That was a very simple village that was fenced in. <clears throat> we were given 30 days to relocate ourselves. You can see empty wagons here going one way direction, the other full wagons going into the ghetto. You could bring anything you could bring with you, but you could not bring in heavy things, needless to say, unless you had access to a horse and buggy that someone would transport it for you. When the, when the, when the prison closed, out of the 40,000, 29,760 children, men, women, were prisoners. And three years later, when we were liberated by the Russians, we looked pretty much like an extermination camp rather than a working camp. Now, <clears throat> if you go to some of the extermination camps like Treblanka, Auschwitz, they had pretty sophisticated systems. We in Kovna did not have gas chambers. We did not have ovens disposing of the body. <clears throat> Treblinka, for example, could kill 12,000 people and get rid of the evidence, the ashes, in a matter of an hour. It was the ultimate German efficiency. Our camp, we did things the old-fashioned way. A bulldozer, several bulldozers would dig a ditch. People would be asked to move over onto the ledge. In most cases, they were naked. And then a couple automatic weapons would fire and kill them. People would fall into the ditch, some of them wounded, not dead yet. And if you were laying on the ledge, a detail, you can see right here one individual, would come along and throw you into the ditch. <coughs> when it was all over and the camp was liberated in 1944, from the original 40,000 citizens, only 2,000 survived. You know, I consider myself incredibly lucky that I'm one of the 2,000. One reflects now, when you carefully and thoughtfully look back, there are many, many antecedents to the Holocaust. The tension between the liberals and the orthodox Jews, the Zionists versus the assimilationists, the economic crisis, the depression, which hit Europe just as badly as it hit the United States, scapegoats for national humiliation, the Versailles treaties from World War I, where Germany was punished maybe a little bit too severely, and a swing to the political right, all help prepare for and facilitate the outbreak of a violent racial anti-Semitism called the Holocaust. With other of Hitler, ideological anti-Semitism captured a state. It achieved a certain amount of legitimacy and acceptance. They were able to go on this killing spree without challenge. And the Nazi regime had widespread support. <clears throat> to include the church as an institution. <coughs> I want to share with you an anecdotal story and kind of an unusual event. In 1989, I was assigned to Berlin as the commanding general of US forces. Berlin was a divided city, as you can see on this crest right here. I think there's a better shot next time. We had a Russian sector, a French sector, a British sector, and a US sector. Within each sector, 
the country that occupied it was the ultimate authority. And in the US sector, there was a facility called the Vanze Villa. I went there a number of occasions, walked through the empty rooms, if the walls could only talk. On 20 January, there was a meeting, 1942. Actually, the meeting was called in December <clears throat> of 41. But in December of 41, the Japanese were going to bomb Pearl Harbor. And they needed all the key people on deck. And so they rescheduled the meeting. And in that meeting, they coordinated and operationalized the extermination plan. The goal was to kill 11 million Jews. <clears throat> now, 11 million was because they had not yet occupied the areas that they were planning to occupy and never really achieved their goal. But they did a pretty good dent by killing six million. The conference lasted only 90 minutes. They had originally scheduled for two days, but everybody came so well prepared, there was considerable cooperation. People were figuring out ways to make trains and cars available to transport the people to the extermination camps. You have to remember, at that time, they were deeply involved in the Eastern Front fighting the Russians, and the winter was coming in. And so to redirect some of their resources towards the extermination, it had to have a pretty high priority. General Reinhard Heydrich was appointed as the overseer of the final solution. That same, after the conference, <clears throat> several months later, he was assassinated by partisans. In attendance were 15 men and one woman, a stenographer, all senior government officials. Over 60% of it had doctor's degrees. There was no protest, there was no discussion of legality and no debate of morality. I think over the years, we couldn't help but ask ourselves, how can it happen in a place that is the cradle of education, intellectual capital, a civilized country? And to this day, people have a difficult time explaining it. There are four distinct groups in this strategy. The perpetrator, the victim, the collaborator. And most books and most <clears throat> movies that you see on the Holocaust, that's who they focus on. But the key player in this is the bystander. The bystander are millions of conspicuous, not by their absence, but by their silence. This murderous approach was tolerated by countless human beings who could have changed the course of history. It could have not been possible to accomplish that if people would have spoken up. Now, the bystander exists to this very day. Not that many years ago, there was a case in New York City it was a Genovese murder. Anybody ever hear that? Yeah, there's a few people. <clears throat> this young woman was stabbed to death multiple times. For 20 minutes, the assailant was attacking that woman. And people were hanging out the windows, looking down, and nobody bothered to call the police. And later on, when they tried to reconstruct the story in the press got into it, the explanation was, was, didn't concern me. I think the bystander is first best captured by Dr. Martin Niebmüller, a leading German Lutheran pastor who ironically died in Dachau, he was in prison. But he wrote a, he wrote a little poem. First, they came for the communists, but since I was not a communist, I did not protest. Then they came for the trade unionists, but since I was not a trade unionist, I did not protest. 
Then they came for the Jews. But since I was not a Jew, I did not protest. And then they came for the Catholics. But since I was not a Catholic, I did not protest. And when they came for me, there was no one there to protest. Let me briefly talk about renewal. Friedrich Nietzsche, a great, well-known philosopher, I'm sure many of you probably studied him, said, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. I found it, my personal experience, true. There's a book written, The Man's Search for Meaning, by Viktor Frankl. Has anybody here read that book by any chance? Yes, you're into deep stuff. Man's search for meaning basically says that you are responsible to find meaning in life. You can't blame it on your parents or blame it on somebody. You are responsible. And it can only be discovered outside of yourself. And you can find it in one of three ways. A love relationship. It doesn't have to be another human being. It can be even an animal, a dog, a cat. But there's a relationship, a deep relationship. Unavoidable suffering. If it's avoidable, the suffering, there's something wrong with you. But this is unavoidable suffering. It can give you meaning in life. And last but not least is work. Your work can give you meaning in life. For me, my military experience, my experience in a concentration camp, and my relationship with my spouse, my wife, Arlene, gave me meaning in life. I'm grateful to this great country of ours for taking me in as a weak, illiterate, and poor immigrant and giving me a chance to be all I, all I can be. When I came here, I didn't, I've never been to school, didn't know how to read or write, could not speak English, and assimilation was not easy, especially when you have language barriers and you bring baggage with you. There were periods in Europe when Jews were embraced and tolerated, and then all of a sudden, the people turned on us with pogroms, with anti-Semitic policies. And my early years, my question was, how is this country any different? We had good relations with our neighbors and friends in Lithuania. And look how they treated us. Not all of them. Let me make it crystal clear. Not all of them. I'm grateful to the lady I married 59 years ago. Long time. Especially when you consider that, that everybody said it won't last. It's not going to last. She, she was a young little girl, grew into a young, beautiful woman. And this guy, who was handsome to start with, <laughs> just keep, kept improving on it. <laughs> and we did get married. She's a Catholic, and I'm a Jew. In 1950, the tolerance level was very low. And in a marriage was a big, big deal. And my experience was that everybody that had an opinion stuck their nose in our relationship. But we were able to manage through it and work our way through it. And we've been together for 59 years. And the way things look like, we're going to last another 59 years. <laughs> Out of those two people, we have a family of 34 individuals. Four daughters, 
four great son-in-law, uh, four, four son-in-laws. <laughs> 17, 14 uh, grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. And, uh, Matthew here, this is an old picture. Matthew is sitting right over here, my grandson. This is David Smith. <laughs> and back here is Andrew Gillette, Matthew's brother. All graduates from this great institution. I'm grateful to the U.S. Army for providing me opportunities beyond my greatest expectations. I did not have a mentor. So I did some very dumb things because I just didn't know any better. I entered the service as a high school dropout. With only months to go before graduation, I decided it's boring. <clears throat> I joined as a private. There's, there's only one way to go from there. It's up. You can't go any lower. I went through the ranks, became a sergeant first class, first sergeant. Then I went to officer's candidate school, was commissioned second lieutenant infantry. I served with a number of units. And then one day, we were on maneuvers. I was a company commander. A company is about 180 men. My officers came to me and they said, uh, I had five officers. They said, there's a message at battalion headquarters. And they won't let us see it, but there's, there's something about volunteering and getting combat pay. So I said, OK, I'll look into it. I had to go up for the critique. I actually bracing myself because on the, on the exercise, we, we screwed up royally. <clears throat> But it turned out that nobody noticed it. So I wasn't about to bring it up. <laughs> and then I asked the adjutant, Ed Valens, I said, can I see the message? He, I was in his office. He says, the boss doesn't want you to see that message. As a matter of fact, the boss doesn't want that message to go out. I said, Ed, we're friends. He tapped the desk with the paper on it and said, Sid, I can't share it with you, but I'm going to the latrine. And he left the office, and I, of course, being honor bound, looked at the message. <laughs> and the message asked for volunteers for special forces. If they were stationed at Fort Bragg, and then we were to deploy after training to a place called Vietnam. I came back from the trip to the headquarters. I told the guys what the message was all about. The message leaked out throughout the battalion. Everybody knew about the message. But there was only one fool that submitted the request, and that was me. And I do not regret that. I spent 32 years as a Green Beret, ultimately being their commanding general. I served for 40 years. 32 of those years in, in Special Forces. And it's amazing how quickly those 40 years went by. I'm still involved with them. They humor me. They invite me over and show me all the latest developments and the latest tactics and techniques and the equipment. And I have to marvel at, at the new generation of warriors that we have. There's a fellow named Bill Helmreich. Bill did a study and wrote a book against all odds. And basically asked the question is, how come some survivors managed to make productive lives for themselves and others had difficulty with it? And what he came up with, actually, is a recipe for any individual for any kind of problem. It doesn't have to be a Holocaust. 
And basically what they found out that the, the ones that had a productive life and uh, succeeded in life were flexible. They were able to change, adapt, and adjust. Assertive. They were able to take the initiative to sell themselves. They were bold. And when a door was slammed in their face, they didn't give up. Tenacity, overcoming obstacles, dealing with failures, walk away from failures more emboldened and learn from those experiences. Optimism, future oriented, positive outlook. You will never see a bird in flight looking backwards. You've got to focus on the future. Look ahead. Distance yourself. Do not that, let that experience intrude on your life. You can't go around feeling guilty that you survived. Emotional intelligence is more important than IQ. And emotional intelligence is understand yourself, empathy for others, and control of emotions. Humor. Humor is the lubricant in life. Don't take yourself too serious. Be able to laugh at yourself. <coughs> Courage. The will and determination to go on. There's two kinds of courage. Moral courage and physical courage. The moral courage is more challenging. Physical courage sometimes is, is almost reactive. The will to live is so strong that you'll find physical courage when you're in real danger. Some people do not. Fear. Fear. Handle fear. I always tell <clears throat> the people that work for me, fear is a good trait. Fear can motivate you, can propel you into action. Like everything else, it's got to be in the right dosage. Fear can also paralyze you. But fear is good. When you are afraid, you're functioning on all eight cylinders. Every part of your body is concentrating. And the important thing is survival, the survival of your friends and warriors on your left and right. Assimilate the knowledge that you have survived. I was felt guilty for a while, but I realized I cannot walk around and punish myself because things worked out for me and they didn't for somebody else. It wasn't that I was so clever. I just had incredible luck. By any standards, the Holocaust stands as the most terrifying example of man's inhumanity to man. Philosopher Santiana said, people who refuse to learn from history are condemned to relive it. My personal experience in life has shown that unless man, a man lives in peace, in order to live in peace, he needs to be blind, deaf, and dumb. And until such time, brace yourself for difficult times. My philosophy in life is very simple. Believe in yourself. Life is not a continuum of pleasant elective choices, but inevitable problems that call for strength, determination, and hard work. Life is simple. It's not easy. And on that note, I'll stop. And I think we were going to have some questions.
So we have a few minutes for questions, and I'll ask you if you have a question. Um, maybe people could make a line right here in the middle of the room, and uh, someone has to go first, and then they can pass the microphone to the person in back of them. Hi. Move forward, I guess. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, my question was, how has your experiences um, in Lithuania and then in the United States affected your practice of Judaism or your relationship with Judaism? <laughs> it presented me with problems. Mm -hmm. The problems were that I had difficulty ex getting explained why. And normally the rabbis would say to me, it's God will. That's the way God wanted it. Well, or some of the people were sinners. But there were young kids that didn't have lived long enough to be sinners. I became to question some of my Judaism. But I never stopped being a Jew. You know, I'll die a Jew, whether I'm a general or whatever. I still am the Jew. I used to be a very religious Jew. I played film. I used to go in Dublin every morning. And then I wrote about it in my book. I was in, <clears throat> in a shul, and someone stole my bicycle. And I said, God, this is the final crowning blow. First, you put me in a concentration camp that you let me suffer through all that without a good explanation. And now, while I'm praying to you, somebody has the audacity to steal the bicycle that I worked for so hard. I cut out some of my religious practices. Did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> uh, of the 34 members of your family, what religion are they? They cover the whole waterfront, from <laughs> agnostic to non-practicing. I think this is the trend in the country. This is you go to Israel, you know. Real religious use are the minority. Anybody? I was just wondering, what helped you and your wife um, work through the prejudices against you being a um, you know, mixed religion couple in that time in America? The military as an institution is a very tolerant institution. <clears throat> it's a great social integrator. When I was a young soldier living in a barracks, you had, you had a squad room where about 30 guys lived in, a, in bunk beds. And on top, you'd have a black guy and a Jew and a Puerto Rican, you name it. We all used the same facilities. We shaved in the same place. We cleaned up in the same place. But we went off post, there were different rules. So I did not experience any problems. I experienced more problems as far as in a marriage when I was still living in Salem, Massachusetts. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Did I? Hi. Um, okay. Oh, I have to stand. Okay. Oh, it doesn't make me much taller. But <laughs> okay. Um, there is a lot of talk about uh, reparations and forgiveness of the Shoah. It's been 75, 76 years since Kristallnacht, which uh, many people mark as the start of the Holocaust. And 
there are mixed feelings about the notion of forgiveness. Do you think um, the perpetrator should be forgiven? Is there an obligation to do so, or is there not? You haven't by any chance read a little book called The Sunflower, did you? Yes. You did. If you look in there, some of the people that write in to The Sunflower, you'll see one said Shack now. It has written in what I thought about it. And basically, when they asked me to comment on what well, this is, is a, is a, is a story where Wiesenthal is uh, working in a, in a labor camp, and he's working at this hospital. And a Nazi officer goes up, and he says, uh, follow me. I, I might take a little liberty with the story. It's been a while since I've read it. He brings him into a room, and there's a dying Nazi officer laying there. And he says to Wiesenthal, I need forgiveness from a Jew. What I've done was terrible, and I realize it. He essentially killed a bunch of people in a house that he set on fire, and children, women, men, all perished. And Wiesenthal stands there, and he, he says, what, what should I do? That's about where the book normally stops and ask the question. Then they hand you the question, the Dalai Lama and a lot of other people. And they were kind of hard up, so they asked me. <laughs> so at first, my first reaction was a gut reaction. And then I said, maybe I'm a little hasty about this. So <clears throat> I was uh, commanding the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center in school. And so I called in a chaplain an imam, a rabbi, Remo Butler, a black colonel, special forces, and a couple of NCOs. And I laid the problem out to them. And I found something very interesting. The rabbi and the imam were very unforgiving. The, the soldiers, the officers like Remo Butler, was very unforgiving. But all the chaplains, the Christians, were very forgiving. My, that's when I decided that, that I didn't have a clear vision. But I decided, I don't know, what the hell does it take to go to hell? If that doesn't meet the criteria, what does meet the criteria? So I said, the good place for him to go is to go to hell. And for Wiesenthal, who the heck is he who anointed him to forgive anybody? If there's going to be any forgiveness, it's going to be the man up there. Folks, I see you're ready to go to bed. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for being such a great audience.